Welcome to the City Current Show, powered by Hagen Botham Insurance and Financial Services. This show focuses on sharing good news and powering the good in our community. Now here's your host, Andrew Bartolotta. Welcome back to the City Current Show, where we bring you inspiring stories of individuals and organizations making an impact and powering the good in our community and around the globe. I'm your host, Andrew Bartolotta, and today we're joined by Eric Hamburg, a multifaceted leader known for his contributions to the nonprofit sector, his successful career as an author, and his influential role in media entrepreneurship. Eric has worn many hats from running nonprofits to finding a hyper-local podcast network, and he's here to share his insights on board governance, the intricacies of nonprofit leadership, and the art of storytelling across various platforms. Eric, thank you so much for taking the time to join us today. Thanks for having me, Andrew. Of course. So you've had a diverse career spanning from being an author to media entrepreneurship and nonprofit leadership. Share really uh, quickly your story and what drives your passion across these varied fields. I think for me, it really comes down to uh, a passion for helping people. Uh, I want to be of service in some way. Um, And that might mean, you know, entertaining them with a really good science fiction novel Or that might mean taking some of the skills that I learned, you know, running a small nonprofit at the age of 23 and growing it. Um, And then writing books kind of to my younger self, you know, teaching, teaching my younger self things that I wish I'd known. That's really the inspiration for the four books I've written for small nonprofits. And speaking of those uh, books, with your extensive experience in the nonprofit sector, what inspired you to really write those books specifically tailored for those small nonprofits? After running the the Grand Cinema, which was a nonprofit movie theater in my hometown of Tacoma, Washington, I my next job was in uh, the fundraising uh, department for a Catholic high school. And if you ever want to see a fundraising machine, it is a Catholic high school. They're really good at it. And I learned so much there. Uh, That's when I think about my younger self. Like I did really well with fundraising at the Grand Cinema, Um, but I tried a lot of things that didn't make sense for a nonprofit of that size. You know, uh, small nonprofits often attempt to copy the NPR model with tote bags and mugs, or they attempt to copy the big gala, you know, like the hospitals or or the Catholic high schools. And those make sense in those contexts, But I tried both of those and I've worked for an NPR station. I have worked at a Catholic high school um, and those models don't apply to small nonprofits. And so I wanted to teach, again, my younger self or anyone who follows their passion into, you know, a small nonprofit but doesn't really know fundraising. Here's what you should be doing. Here's what you should be focused on. And that was uh, the spark for my book on fundraising called The Little Book of Gold that I wrote in, I think, 2009 it's still selling because those principles are still relevant today. Well, it's really great that you brought your uh, breadth of knowledge and then also experiences to say, here's what I learned and here's what I can share with others. I've worked at a uh, medium-sized nonprofit. I've served on a board of a small nonprofit and volunteer with larger nonprofits. And it is just because you're a nonprofit doesn't fit you in one category, that's for sure. And so to be able for the small nonprofits to be inspired, motivated, energetic, to raise funds, but also stay true to their mission is great. And to have a playbook out there is so important. Let's switch a little bit over to joining a board of directors, because that can be a significant commitment. What initially drew you to board service, and how has your perspective on its importance evolved over time? I was drawn to board service, you know, it was really modeled by my parents. Um, You know, I grew up and my mom was on the PTA and my dad was on church council, or might have been vice versa. I don't actually remember which one was on which, but uh, my dad was on the board of our local zoo. And... It, it just seemed like the thing that adults did, you know, and it was how you give back. And so that's what it was modeled for me. Um, when I first joined a board, I thought, um, this is great. You know, I'm, I'm now an adult. Little did I know that there is actually like financial and legal responsibilities tied to being on a board. And in fact, that board um, had a significant debt. And they came to the board members and they're like, we are obligated to pay this. And I was like, what are you talking about? No one told me this. Uh, And that was my very first board. 
it speaks to how much I like board service that I've kept going. I've been on something like a dozen boards and committees and 12 years in elected office on a board. Um, I love working in groups. I love that feeling of generative discussion that can come. Um, I love creating the, the container that allows the nonprofit to do its work. One of the things, the biggest errors that I see, you know, in myself and then others, if it's their first time board, they think that they get to do the work. And it kind of makes sense. Like if you join the board of a community theater, um, it's probably because you love theater. You know, it makes sense. Um, but we had a theater in Tacoma that, that uh, closed. And right before they closed, uh, they had hired, the, brought on this new board member. And uh, she was quoted in the paper as saying, you know, I thought we got to pick the place. And it was so sad for me to see, you know, this organization that was close to, you know, months away from closure, they bring on a new board member and they hadn't even told her like what our job is. You know, our job is to advocate, to budget, to fundraise. Um, we don't get to pick the plays. And I think that that's one of the things that a lot of people mistake, that they think that they're going to do the work. Um, you are helping an organization continue. I think about boards as being the way that a good idea carries into the future. You need some some keepers of the flame uh, to keep it around, even when the original founder or the original staff have moved on. It's the board that keeps an organization going. Very well said. I know my first board experience, I was, I would say I was definitely, it was before I was 21 because they would have some sort of like board after parties at the bar that I was unable to uh, join them for. But um, my first experience, it felt very sort of like George Washington-esque with, 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 uh, with Shakespearean words and things that I didn't understand and gavels. And I just pictured that people would have those white wigs on and it felt very just like prim and proper. And I thought I have no business being here, but they wanted to expand their social media and their, their marketing and branding. And so, um, you know, after a few times and after really having that playbook of here's your board roles and responsibilities, which I wish I would have had beforehand knowing what I was getting into, that really did shape uh, my experience on the board and able to work with some incredible people. I think one of the, the great things about, especially like young professionals joining boards or even having a young professional's board within the nonprofit is that you can garner so much expertise from like-minded people or a certain area, like you said, community theater. Okay, we know that we have this commonality here. Here's where we can learn from each other. And you may be in a different sector or industry, but we're able to you know, align our interests. Share some advice on how someone can identify a board position that aligns with their interests and skills. I think that that's a really key place to start because there are good reasons to want to be on a board, networking, skill building, um, you know, building uh, the the community trust in some way. Um, it, there's, there's really nice, nice things that come with being on a board. But if you don't have that passion for the organization, those long nights, <laughs> you know, a, a board meeting that goes long, um, an early morning committee meeting, those are going to keep you from your family, your job, just hanging out and watching Netflix. And so you really have to love what the organization does um, in order to be willing to make, you know, a little bit of sacrifice of time. And so I really think, you know, it's a question of how big of a dent do you want to make in the universe? You know, some people want to just make their their neighborhood better, their their small town some people are focused on the state, you know, some people are focused on, you know, what can I do in the nation or the country? Um, and, you know, what really gets gets me interested? Is it community theater? Is it environmental advocacy, homelessness, um, some, you know, political cause? All of those things are really worthwhile. Um, and, you know, I, you know, just do some Googling, you know, let's start there, get on people's newsletters. See what organizations are out there, see who's communicating, see what they're talking about and see what resonates. Um, and at that point, maybe make a donation. You know, most board members are donors and the donor pool is a common place to find new board members. Make a donation uh, and get closer to an organization that interests you. And you can start that that board conversation, possibly. 
I like that you talk about the curiosity of an advocacy area that you're passionate about. Um, when I was in high school, I was trying to build my portfolio um, for graphic design school and happened upon the volunteer mid south. And so then I'm finding that dress for success needed someone to help with an upcoming event and gala. And then from there, you know, I find myself working with an incredible group of people and then ultimately start serving on that board because I had a passion for creativity, curiosity, critical thinking. And so that really does develop who you are and provide opportunities for you because you're you're able to get out there and just start asking questions on how can I help? How can I make a difference? What would you say would be like two to three crucial questions that prospective board members should ask before really committing to join a nonprofit board? Yeah. Um, you know, asking any questions is a start. <laughs> I wish I'd asked more questions before I joined that first board that I did. Um you know, let's start with like, when are the meetings like brass tacks, you know, if the meeting is every third Monday, and you know, you have a standing commitment with your job, you probably can't join that board, because so much of the work happens in meetings, you know, so that's, that's one of those things. If it's a national organization, and you're required to, you know, take a flight uh, quarterly to get to board meetings on your own dime, um, and that's more than you can read, you know, afford, maybe that's not the right board for you. Um, at this time. So thinking about just like the practicality of it, it's a really good place to start. And you can right there probably um, eliminate an organization or find out, oh, no, this will work great. So that's one of those things to ask. If you are at all numbers inclined, you can ask to see the most recent um, financial statement, like the board got or something like that. Um, Boards often get, you know, maybe a week before a meeting, something like a board packet, you know, here's our minutes, here's our agenda, here's what we're talking about. You can just ask for the most recent board packet. Um, and you'll see if they're if they're interested in you and you're interested in them, they should be willing to share this. Um, they you'll see very quickly, like, is this the kind of thing I want to focus on? Is this the work that I want to be doing? Um, and if you have the opportunity where are you going, you know, as an organization, what what's coming up next, it would be really good to know, for example, that next year, there will be a capital campaign, or next year, we're, you know, we're going to be launching a, a strategic plan, or the director tells you after, you know, 20 years, I'm going to retire next year. Like, these are all good things to know, none of them should necessarily sway you one way or the other. But it's good to go in uh, eyes wide open. Um, in those kinds of in those kinds of situations. Very uh, well said. I'm thinking about the experiences I've had on boards where you come in and then you realize that they are massively in debt and maybe the model that they've been working on for the past 30 years is not working in this digital age. Or you have a founder, an executive director where they've had this nonprofit for over a decade and they're burnt out and wanting to, to take a different way and you're going... I just came into this. I thought I was propelled for the excitement because of your energy and your creativity and the passion that you had with this nonprofit. And now like we're getting handed this, what do we do next? And so there is a lot of work ahead for those that, um, that jump on a board, but it is so fulfilling as well. When you think about the relationships that you're able to make and the impact that you're able to have. Before we uh, transition a bit, how should a board, a new board member approach their relationship with the executive director to foster a productive and supportive partnership. You as a board member are not the executive director's boss. And it's really easy to think that because the executive director reports to the board. Um, but that board director, board CEO, whatever that you know relationship is, it's so weird. <laughs> like, I can't think of any other place where it's like, yes, you have seven bosses or 11. Uh, when I was hired at the Grand Cinema, it was a board of 17. Um, it was a big board and many boards, you know, are even larger than that. Um, you aren't, you know, one seventeenth of that person's boss. Like it, it doesn't work like that. Um, you work in a group. Uh, you should be funneling, you know, they, they report to the board as a whole, the policies that you pass, the budget that you pass. It's absolutely appropriate to invite them out for coffee or lunch, 
and get to know them and express what you're interested in and hear what they're thinking about. All of those things are great. But it, you don't want to start asking for, can you generate a five page report for me on the, you know, the, the, what, how social media has affected our business plan? Like that's not, that's not what you get to do. Imagine if every single board member did that. Um, the executive director wouldn't get anything done. So it's really about not, not going rogue, so to speak, and to uh, spend the time working in the groups and improve the board. You know, whatever you can do to improve the board will, actually really help the executive director too. Great tips there. And now transitioning a bit, you we did mention, of course, you're an author for, you know, nonprofit leadership, board training, but also science fiction, which is really cool. What parallels do you see between storytelling and uh, science fiction books, but then storytelling in the nonprofit sector as well? You know, I don't know that anyone's ever asked me that question before. <laughs> I love it. Um, Nonprofits today, it's it's not enough to just be well respected or well regarded. You need to be beloved. You know, if you think about your Facebook feed, and if you're lucky enough to even see a post from a nonprofit that you love, it's sandwiched between a, a cute cat video and a post from your your you know aunt and a friend. And, you know, like it's that post has to be so compelling to grab someone's attention. Um, it's one of the things that I think people have forgotten is that you need to really, you really need to reach out and engage people. Um, we're all the stars of our own movies or books, you know, as it is, we all think we're the hero. Um, but most of the time people aren't thinking about us. Most of the time they're out doing their, their own thing. And it's tempting to just let at a nonprofit to let communications fall, you know, fall quiet because no, you know, no one's really responding to our emails anyway. But if you can think about, you know, stories you like, books you like, tell a story of a hero, tell a story that grabs someone's heart, try to have that emotional connection. That is what I try to do in my books. You know, I'm writing about futuristic technology. Um, but if I spent the whole time talking about the technology, and not the people that it affects or the emotions and what it's like to live in that world. Um, it's not a very compelling book. And so the same thing I think is true of nonprofits. Like we're this, we're here to solve this problem. Um, here's what it means. Here's what it, here's what it feels like. Um, and those are the stories that people really connect with. And speaking of stories and connecting with people quickly talk about you co-founded channel 253 focusing on the Tacoma through various podcasts. So what gap did you see in the media landscape locally that you're aiming to fill? Yes, yeah, so channel, uh, it's channel 253, that's our uh, area code here. Um, there was this idea that, that uh, the Seattle media market, uh, which Tacoma is a part of, um, they only came to Tacoma to report on, you know, the bad things that happened, the, the shootings or whatever. Um, so there was a, this, this chip on our shoulder that Tacoma often has as the second city to Seattle. Um, and I think that that informed it. There was also, you know, our local, uh, our local newspaper kept getting smaller and smaller. And so I had this idea that, you know, in this, you know, we're, we're 200 and some odd thousand people. We're not a small town, but sometimes it feels like a small town, um, what can we what can we share that's not being covered by the big Seattle uh, folks? And what can we share that people just don't hear anymore? You know, people uh, in a small town, things aren't said on the air. What if we set them on the air? What if we talked about, you know, the, the people and, and how people really talk, how insiders talk? Um, it's been really it's been really a joy. I've hosted a few uh, podcasts on the network right now. I'm the host of Citizen Tacoma, where I interview elected officials, candidates for office, nonprofit executive directors. You know what's what's happening in Tacoma um, from that lens, and it's it's really a joy to have this new way of reaching out to people. It's really you know there's there's just like this conversation here. It's so rare to hear someone talk for fifteen minutes, thirty minutes, uh, or longer. Um, it's a real joy when you can do it. 
It really is. I I really enjoy the hyper local journalism approach because it is so well needed. And because of the technology that we have access to, you know, we're able to talk th- across time zones across the United States, but to then think about those stories that are untold in our neighborhoods, in our own backyard, where we're able to provide a platform for them to share their story and inspire others. Uh, I help co-host uh, through our DeSoto County, Mississippi tourism, the Discovering DeSoto podcast, and and providing a platform for our local businesses and and city officials to share the good things that are happening is so well needed and encouraging our local chambers to launch their podcasts and even have, you know, repurpose the videos and how you can create short form videos, storytelling, not only from the nonprofit side, but just your local civic organizations, communities and parks and recreation. And there's just, there's real beauty to be had to providing a platform for those local leaders. And and when I say leaders, it's not elected leaders. Many of the times it's the mom and pop shops. It's the, it's the volunteers and saying, we recognize you and we're giving you a platform to share your lessons learned too. It's uh, really fun. So that's really cool that you're you're doing that in your area. Absolutely. Thank you. What puts a smile on your face when you look at the work that you've been able to do from being a science fiction author to board governance, to running nonprofits, to uh, you know having a family in the Tacoma area? Like what puts a smile on your face? I really, I love hearing from people. Um, I am touched when I get an email from someone um, I I read your book, are nonprofits going through this? What do you think? And I don't charge for, you know, my reply. Um, You know, I'll give my best shot via email and see if I can help. And sometimes I've been doing that for years with a nonprofit. You know, they're like, hey, now we're doing this. What do you think of this? Um, I, I am honored that they read the book, that they thought enough to reach out to me, that I can keep in contact Um, And the same is true of the books, you know, I've seen, um, you know, I've looked at my own book reviews, you know, as probably any author has, and it's really touching to see uh, someone say, you know, couldn't put it down and, you know, something like that for a novel. Um, It is really meaningful. If you've ever wondered if you liked a book and, you know, it's very likely that the author reads a review. So you might you might consider writing one if you if you did really like it. But again, the emails, you know, are are just so exciting to get. And uh, I love that connection that comes from, you know, what is either a a nonfiction how to book or a a work of fiction that came out of my my head where I just sat in in front of my computer and typed a lot and look what happened. So. Well, I think there's a lesson there too across sectors from when you think about if you if you enjoy reading a book, please leave a review for the author to or or find their email and or and, and let them know that their work isn't just out there in the ethos and no one's taking uh you know lessons from it. Do that. But then also from the nonprofit side, if you attend a 5K and you really enjoyed it, or you see the work that a nonprofit is doing. You know, many of the times they're underpaid, under-resourced, they're doing the best they can. And for them to receive just a note of gratitude goes a long way. So um, I think there's there's a lesson there as well. Finally, where can Absolutely. our listeners find more about your work, your books, purchase your books, and possibly get involved with the causes that you're passionate about? EricHanberg.com has all of my books that I've written. It's got the, the complete compendium. But if you're interested in the nonprofit work, uh, I built a site called foursmallnonprofits.com. And there's a couple things that I'll mention there. One of them is, is that I built a free like mini course on how to get on a board of directors. And that's a, we've talked about some of those things, but if you really are serious about it, it's free and it just walks you through, like here's some of the questions to ask, here's how to have those conversations and, and try to get on a board. So that is one thing that is on that site. And if you are at a nonprofit, I've put together a bundle of books on my website where you can get uh, the book on how to be a good board member at a really d- deep discount. And then the books on it for that might be more useful for a director for free. And so it's something that allows me to offer something that Amazon doesn't. Um, although, you know, very happy if you just want to go to Amazon and buy my book too. Uh, but it does allow me to do something that saves you money 
and um, that's me a little bit more as well. Awesome. Well, Eric, thank you for inspiring others. Thank you for your dedication to service and community uh, support. Thank you for sharing your wisdom and powering the good in our community and around the globe. Thank you so much. It was a joy to be here.